Whitehall Glens Falls. It's 8 o'clock. Morning. This is Northern Light for Monday, February 5th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Mo. School districts around the North Country were expecting their state funding to hold steady this year. Then Governor Hochul released her state spending plan. When we saw the numbers that came out, um, I mean, it was drastically different. If that did come to pass, it would be absolutely catastrophic for this district. We'll hear reaction from educators about the budget before legislators hash it out the final plan. A new study could offer insight on the symptoms that affect veterans who were exposed to burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'd get sick for three months straight, essentially. It would start around September from a cold um, to a sinus infection to the flu to bronchitis and just constant. And I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Also on the show, lead tackle is still a leading cause of loon deaths in the Adirondacks. Usually, every loon that dies from lead poisoning, there's also a hook in their gizzard somewhere. We'll hear from a couple of loon experts with the latest data. And New York lawmakers have proposed a bill that would change how students in public schools learn about climate change. All of that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by carcomplaints.com, providing information about squeaks, bangs, flashing lights, odd smells, and other vehicle complaints online at carcomplaints.com. And by Adirondack Experience, the museum on Blue Mountain Lake, hosting ADKX Winter Fun Day on Monday, February 19th, featuring indoor and outdoor activities. Details at theadkx.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Educators and lawmakers on both sides, of the, uh, both sides of the aisle are outraged over the way Governor Hochul is funding schools in her new budget plan. It's a record $825 million for public schools, but for the first time in years, some schools would actually lose funding, forcing districts to consider teacher and program cuts. Dozens of North Country districts would face that scenario if the legislature doesn't make changes. Our education reporter, Amy Feireisel, has the story. Christopher Clapper is the superintendent of Alexandria Central School District, which serves about 500 kids in Alexandria Bay in Jefferson County. With increases in state aid over the last few years, they got a 3% increase for two years from foundation aid being fully funded. He says they've been able to do a lot. That has included buying all student supplies, so so that burden is not parents. They've had free school lunch for all students since 2021. They've increased college credit classes in the high school. But Clapper says he and other superintendents knew they couldn't count on more increases. We had all assumed that we would be uh, dropped down to zero. There'd be no growth in okay. foundation aid uh, for whole homeless districts. And that's kind of what my colleagues and I you know, around the North Country have been budgeting for. Then Governor Kathy Hochul released her budget proposal, and Clapper was shocked. When we saw the numbers that came out, um, I mean, it was drastically different. It was a 13% decrease in aid, a loss of just over $500,000. If that did come to pass, it would be absolutely catastrophic for this district. That whiplash moment was happening all over the North Country. 37 school districts, a little less than half of the region's districts, face cuts in their aid. Saranac Central School District in Clinton County would receive $1.5 million less in aid. Clifton Fine and Cranberry Lake, a million. Those losses are tied to a New York provision that requires the state to give districts at least as much aid as they got the year before, even if they have fewer students. It's called Hold Harmless, and many North Country school districts fall under that umbrella. Governor Hochul's new budget proposal eliminates Hold Harmless. In her budget address, the governor said it's out of date. It's, it's just overdue for an assessment. These numbers were put in place with this Hold Harmless plan, I think since 2008. She said populations have shifted since then. And some districts that may not have been high need before are higher need. I want to make sure I have the flexibility to take care of our high need school districts. 
Criticism of the proposed budget has been swift and loud from education leaders, teachers unions, advocacy groups, and lawmakers from both sides of the aisle. Last Thursday, Senator Dan Steck joined other lawmakers, Republicans and Democrats, to speak at a legislative hearing on education. Does anyone look at these runs before they put them out and fire up uh, 337 school districts that are all staring at cuts in the face? He listed off North Country districts with double-digit losses in aid. Keene, 32 percent. Lake Placid, 42 percent. Minerva, 25 percent. Newcomb, 46 percent. Screw Lake, 17 percent. Parishville Hopkinton, 12 percent. These are devastating cuts. Governor Hochul has pushed back hard on the idea that this year's budget is a cut after years of historic increases and $13 billion for state education from the American Rescue Plan Act. In a recent op-ed, Blake Washington, Hochul's Division of Budget Director, wrote, Instead of asking the question, how much more money are our schools getting? It should be, why do we have a formula that forces us to pay for students that don't exist? He's referring to the fact that New York school enrollment has declined by about 10% since 2014. In Alexandria Central School District, it's been about a 25% decrease since 2014, from roughly 620 to 460 kids. But educating students doesn't happen on a per-pupil basis, says Superintendent Chris Clapper. If you have a kindergarten class of 20 students, and then that that kindergarten class uh, decreases to 17 students, it's not as though... Uh, there's less cost of maintaining a classroom. He says you can't hire 75% of a teacher. You can't heat part of a room. If the budget were to pass as proposed in April, Clapper says Alexandria would weather the storm. They have reserves. But they'd only last so long, says Brianne Durham, the district's business administrator. We do have a fund balance that can get us through for one year. Um, But beyond that, I don't think it's going to be fiscally possible to continue using that because the fund balance would be pretty much wiped out at that point. Across the North Country in northern Washington County, the Putnam Central School District is facing one of the steepest reductions in the state. The K-6 through district, with just 50 students, would lose about $300,000, 50% of its state aid. Superintendent Matt Boucher called it draconian. It is a substantial amount. I've never seen a cut like this uh, in my 20 years. Putnam is also a hold harmless district, and Boucher says the state considers it wealthy because of a large number of lakefront second homes. But he says the kids in his school are anything but. In our student populations, our free and reduced lunch uh, ratio is like 68%. Districts everywhere are counting on a lot changing in the next few months. Boucher says he doesn't expect the current numbers to hold. There's always some, yeah, there's always some negotiation and, and hopefully it will, it, will, it will take place this time. Christopher Clapper, the superintendent in Alexandria Bay, says he's heartened by support from local lawmakers. In the age of, of partisanship, to have a bipartisan initiative uh, from our legislators to say, look, this isn't right. This can't happen. If we have to talk about uh, tough choices, we can't do it on the backs of our kids and the backs of our education. The clock is ticking until the April 1st budget deadline to change that. Amy Feierisel, North Country Public Radio. The mayor of the city of Plattsburgh announced Friday that he will not run for re-election. First-term mayor Chris Rosenquist shared the news at a breakfast held by the North Country Chamber of Commerce. According to the Plattsburgh Press Republican, Rosenquist said he wants to spend more time with his family. He has a six-year-old son. The Democrat was elected the city's first black mayor in 2020. He worked to resolve years-long legal disputes with the town of Plattsburgh and pushed for the reconstruction of a major downtown street. Some of Rosenquist's more controversial actions included a successful push to demolish the Crate Memorial Civic Center. He also tried and failed to get council approval to sell waterfront property to a hotel developer last year. With Rosenquist out of the race, Pletchburg will elect its fourth mayor in four terms this November. New York lawmakers have proposed a bill that would change how students in public schools learn about climate change. Dozens of educators from around the state signed a letter in support of the bill last month, co-written by a professor at Paul Smith's College. Lucy Grindon has more. The climate education bill has been around since 2019, but Democratic lawmakers introduced an updated version in November. If it passed, the bill would establish a state office of climate education and workforce development. 
It would also give teachers frameworks for integrating climate education into their classes, and it would create career readiness programs to prepare students for climate-related jobs. Joe Henderson is a professor at Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks. This semester, he's teaching a course on sustainable development. He recently asked his students if they'd ever taken a class related to climate change. I was asking them, like, how many of them have actually had any kind of climate change education? And maybe a third of the class hands went up. But Henderson wasn't surprised that so few of them had been in climate classes before. He says New York currently places less emphasis on climate education than some other states. We're lagging behind places like New Jersey, Connecticut, California. Henderson co-wrote a letter in support of the environmental education bill signed by dozens of New York educators. But he says students are the main driving force behind the lobbying for more climate education. It makes sense, right, that students are demanding this kind of education because it's their lives. The text of the bill says it would stress environmental justice, which looks at how environmental problems disproportionately impact different people, based on factors like where they live, how much money they have, race, and gender. The bill would also emphasize interdisciplinary learning about climate change, integrating the topic not just in science classes, but across subjects like history, English, and math. Lucy Grindon, North Country Public Radio. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. Good morning. It's eight twelve. I'm Todd Mo, and I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up, Adirondack loon biologists say lead poisoning is still a major cause of loon deaths. We'll hear more coming up in just a few minutes here on Northern Light. Music by Evan Veenstra out of Gananoque, Ontario. Broadcast of Northern Light is supported by Apothecary Chocolates, making gourmet chocolates by hand from all natural herbs, botanicals, and tree syrups, apothecarychocolates.com. And by Village Mercant- the Village Mercantile in Saranac Lake, established in 2011 with a mission of community-fueled solutions with essentials for home, camp, and gift-giving. VillageMerc.com, anything but general. A new study on veterans' health is tracking the long-term effects of toxic exposure from burn pits during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It uses artificial intelligence in a finger-worn monitor to collect health data over several years. Researchers say they want to learn more about burn pit exposure and develop new tests and treatments. Desiree Diorio reports for the American Homefront Project. During the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the military used open-air burn pits to get rid of garbage. Plastics, metal, even biohazardous waste were doused in jet fuel and set on fire. Millions of service members inhaled the noxious fumes, including Chad Lennon. Today, he's a major in the Marine Corps Reserves. But for seven months in 2010, he served in Afghanistan, where he says he often slept near the black plumes of smoke rising from the pit. You name it, it was in there electronics, paper, wag bags, which are the bags everyone pees and poops in. I wouldn't even be surprised if there was body parts thrown in there. Sitting in his doctor's office on Long Island, New York, Lennon says he began to notice odd symptoms, like shortness of breath and tightness in his chest, that the lifelong runner hadn't experienced before. And it got progressively worse. I'd get sick for three months straight, essentially. It would start around September from a cold... Um, to a sinus infection, to the flu, to bronchitis. 
and just constant. And I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. Lennon and other veterans are enrolled in a new long-term study to remotely collect real-time data on their health, like heart rate and EKGs, and to create new screening tools for veterans who get health care from private doctors instead of the VA. And you, the way you charge it, you just plug in the USB port in the computer. And then Dr. Anthony Sema is the pulmonologist leading the study through Northwell Health, one of the largest health systems in New York. Now technology allows us to remotely monitor patients. And what, what that means is we can stick a ring in somebody's finger. It goes to their phone. The veteran can look at their oxygen saturation and heart rate because it's continuous pulse oximeter. If the ring detects, for example, symptoms of a panic attack, Sema says the app will alert the veteran and prompt them to fill out a specialized survey on the real world stimuli the veteran is experiencing. This is actually big data or artificial intelligence, because if we're taking readings every five seconds for the next two years, that's a lot of information. Sema says he hopes the real-time monitoring and standardized screening questionnaires will help define what veterans often report as vague, hard-to-explain symptoms. They'll say, I just don't feel right, and all the breathing tests are normal, and the you know, chest x-ray CAT scan is normal. The results of the study over time will add to a growing body of research about the impacts of toxic exposure from burn pits and could also lead to new diagnostic tools for lung diseases. Just like the herbicide Agent Orange caused a slew of health problems for Vietnam War veterans, Sema says diseases from burn pit exposure will continue to plague the veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. Because this was such a long war, longer than World War II in Vietnam, and there's so more, many more people, that it's going to affect a larger portion of veterans, and, and the exposure was so long. Lennon, the Marine reservist, says he's participating in the study now because he's worried about his future and he wants to be proactive. I'm trying to do whatever I can. Um, I know my wife's concerned and, you know, especially with the guys I served with who are young, dying of cancer, and you just hear this all the time. In 2022, the PACT Act became law, making it easier for veterans who became sick from burn pit exposure to get health and disability benefits from the VA. About 3.5 million veterans could be eligible. And doctors like Anthony Sema are still investigating what long-term effects might be in store for this latest cohort of warfighters. I'm Desiree DiOrio on Long Island. This story was produced by the American Homefront Project, a public media collaboration that reports on American military life and veterans. Paul Smith's College will be updating its water system soon. As the Adirondack Daily Enterprise reports, the college's water has been cloudy and discolored, even brown for years now. The color comes from the school's 80-year-old pipes, which are made of iron. The college says the water is safe to drink, but ugly. Paul Smith recently received a $1 million grant from the Northern Border Regional Commission to help replace the campus pipes and filtration systems. Paul Smith's president, Dan Kelting, says they don't have a start date for the project yet. More warm and sunny destinations will be added to the Plattsburgh Airport's roster. That's according to Breeze Airways, the new airline that started service to Orlando in November. Last week, the airline launched a new route to Tampa with flights available on Mondays and Fridays through April. Clinton County legislator Bobby Hall told the Plattsburgh Press Republican that Breeze Airways will be announcing two additional destinations in the near future. The Warren County Board of Elections is seeking poll workers to help run voting locations on Election Day. County officials expect heavy voter turnout on November 5th because of the presidential election. They say having polling locations fully staffed with trained workers is critical to making sure all voters can cast a ballot. If you'd like to be a poll worker, you must live in Warren County, be registered to vote, and be at least 17 years old. Hundreds of athletes competed in the Adirondacks this weekend in the Empire State Winter Games. The Olympic-style competitions are for competitors of all ages and abilities. It includes several winter sports, including bobsled, skeleton, adaptive biathlon, adaptive downhill, and sled hockey, which is a seated version of hockey. Athletes competed at venues throughout the region, including Whiteface Mountain, Mount Pisgah, and the Tupper Lake Civic Center. The events are through a partnership with the Olympic Regional Development Authority, Adirondack Sports Council, and local towns. 
A North Country man came in second on the long-running game show Wheel of Fortune last Thursday night. 34-year-old Joey Johnson lives in Watertown. He's a disc jockey and a coordinator for the Food Bank of Central New York. Johnson auditioned for Wheel of Fortune last year. He flew to Los Angeles to tape his episode in December. He came in second and told WWNY-TV that it was a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You're listening to Northern Lights here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up in just a minute, we'll hear from loon biologists about the ongoing problem with lead tackle and loon mortality in the Adirondacks. Then stick around uh, stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Yeah, just look out the window. There's blue sky. There's sunshine. What is that bright thing in the up there in the sky, huh? The day, the day star. <laughs> the day star, the day star. Thank you. Yeah. So sunshine today, probably tomorrow, Wednesday, highs this afternoon, upper 20s, low 30s, clear cold tonight, lows in the single digits. And then tomorrow, weather service says a good chance of more sunshine, highs in the low 30s. Right now, 21 degrees here in Canton. Although legislation was passed 20 years ago that banned the sale of small lead fishing tackle in New York, the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation continues to report Adirondack loons dying from lead poisoning after ingesting lead tackle like sinkers that are still legal to use. Last year, five out of 12 dead loons that were collected and submitted to the DEC's Wildlife Health Program for necrop- uh, necropsy uh, died due to lead poisoning, making it the leading cause of death in loons. Other causes of death include trauma, illness, and parasites. I spoke with Dr. Nina Schock, the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation's Executive Director and Wildlife Veterinarian, and Griffin Archambault, Research Biologist for the Center. Dr. Schock says loons will almost certainly die after ingesting even a single small piece of lead with the fish they catch. Unlike dabbling ducks and waterfowl, they aren't grazing seed and stuff from the bottom of the lake so lead shot is not what they're ingesting they're actually ingesting the tackle that is still on a line when a a fish breaks a line and so one piece of lead tackle can kill a loon usually every loon that dies from lead poisoning there's also a hook in their gizzard somewhere or in their gi tract and almost every single loon that dies from lead poisoning still has the piece of lead in its GI tract. Another potential issue, too, is that the Adirondacks obviously has a boom in the summers with people coming from out of state a lot of times to fish. So it is possible that people are actually still buying these lead tackle out of state and just bringing them in. The use is not banned, so it's not illegal. They're not breaking the law. In New York, legislation banning the sale of small lead sinkers, a half ounce or less, was enacted in 2004. But... It's not illegal to use lead tackle in New York waters. Biologists are urging anglers to use non-lead fishing weights. Two notable lead poisoning deaths in 2023 occurred on Lake Placid, which had a pair successfully raised chicks for the past two years. One of the dead loons was a female who was found in that pair's territory. Mary Schubert, a longtime Lake Placid resident, says it's heartbreaking to know the loons on Lake Placid last summer were preventable and caused by human behavior. Schubert is part of a group of Lake Placid residents that regularly monitors the loons on the lake. We've lived on Lake Placid Lake for 46 years year-round, which is quite unusual. We have a small year-round population on the lake. We've enjoyed watching and listening to loons all that time, and when Nina shock and the loon center started a loon census i got involved right from the get-go our population has been growing and the last two years we've had a count of 14 loons in this uh, loon count which is one hour one saturday once a year Mm -hmm. we're thrilled with those results and also the last 
two years, we've had a successful um, mating pair that has laid eggs and um, raised chicks on our lake in one of the bays. To have um, chicks being raised on the lake and watching them uh, grow and thrive was so exciting. And then at the end of our season, um, late September, a friend contacted me and said she was over at our the Lake Placid Dam, which is the outlet for the lake, and a loon had gone over the dam and uh, it didn't look well. So she, I got her in touch with the uh, loon center in Saranac Lake, and they came and picked up the bird and tried to nurse it, and it, it died, I think, two days later. Just a few weeks later, the loon center was advised that there was a dead loon in a different location on our lake. So it too was uh, collected and sent for a study at the DEC lab. And just recently, uh, the results came back that both of these birds had died from lead poisoning. Hmm. It was a call to arms. This is something that humans are causing. It's in the tackle that people use, have used forever. If we can get education to get on board and get people on board to realize it's affecting loons and as well as other animals and species that we all love. So it's an important topic um, to all of us who, who love wildlife. Mary Schubert is a longtime Lake Placid resident and avid birder. So with a healthy loon population in New York, what is the overall concern about lead poisoning? Dr. Nina Schock and Griffin Archambold say common loons are a long-lived species with a relatively low reproductive rate, so their populations are significantly affected by even small changes in adult loon survival. So they're called a case-selected species as opposed to an R-selected species in ecology. So case-selected means that they reproduce very slowly, they only have a small number of babies, and they live a long time. So that's what happens with loons. They only need, one pair only needs two chicks to make it to survival, I mean, to reproductive success, you know, maturity to um, replace them. And that was definitely happening in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And now what we're seeing is a decrease in reproductive success. So they aren't, we don't even think that we're having enough chicks survive to reproductive age maturity to keep the population going long term. What we're seeing is the adult population is very good right now, but the chick population is decreasing as opposed to something like a mallard that produces 9, 10, 12 chicks a year and um, they only live six or seven years. So they're producing more and living shorter. Yeah. And Nina mentioned earlier the Loon Preservation Committee in New Hampshire. They've also done some other population modeling before where they showed that loon populations are most sensitive to changes in adult survival rates Mm -hmm. because the adults are so long lived and they have such a low reproductive rate. Those healthy breeding age adults need to survive for a long time to have that low breeding rate actually allow for some chicks to survive to reproductive to their actual reproductive stage. And so loons, when they actually are chicks, they fly out to the ocean after that first summer they don't reach sexual maturity until three or four years old. And then they typically don't breed for the first time until they're six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. So even when those chicks do fledge out to the ocean, it takes a long time for them to return and reproduce for the first time. If they even return at all, obviously some are going to be lost before they even make it back to the Adirondacks. So keeping that adult population healthy and producing chicks over a long period of time is the biggest key to keeping our population healthy for a long period of time. Griffin Archambold is a research biologist with the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation in Saranac Lake. We also heard from the center's director, Dr. Nina Schock. They urge anglers to take part in the Lead Tackle Buyback Program to help eliminate these preventable deaths. An ounce or more of their lead tackle can be exchanged for a $10 voucher for non-toxic tackle at participating fishing uh, outfitters across the Adirondacks. And there are links with more information on our website, ncpr.org. 
That's it for Northern Light. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. Then join us later this morning for an important conversation on 1A, South Carolina's turn in the primary spotlight. That's coming up between 10 and noon right here on NCPR. I'm Monica Sandresky. I'm Todd Moe. Thanks for listening. Be well.